From fur trading outpost to major American cities, St. Louis, an illustrated timeline. That's next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter and welcome to City Corner. Carol Farring Shepley is an author and her latest book is St. Louis, an illustrated timeline, blues, baseball, books, crooks, civil rights, and the river. Carol, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Steve. It's quite a title you've got there. <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what's the whole timeline idea of your book? And that's one aspect I really like the most. You know, there are a lot of um, books, lots of books written about St. Louis and about St. Louis history. I find yours just present it a little bit differently, and I like it. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm really interested in chronology. A lot of times you don't realize things that happened at the exact same time. Oh, for instance, there's a time around the 1870s when St. Louis had one of the very first women lawyers. It had um, Virginia Minor t uh, trying to vote, one of the first women trying to vote. Susan Blow introduced in kindergarten. But if you read in a thematic book, you wouldn't know chron chronolo chronologically that this was such an exciting time. So what your book does, it starts at the very beginning, just about the time of the big mound, right? Exactly. And it goes through to the present day. And what I like about it too, it's not like a big, long history lesson. Each uh, little subject matter is less than a page, mm -hmm. and it's, it's got an illustration or a photograph, and just a little synopsis, I guess you might put it like that. Yes, yes, yes. Some things uh, I went into greater depth than others, particularly when I felt that they weren't as well known, you know, that it, it was a good opportunity to educate people. You bring that up. There are a lot of things or a lot of topics for people uh, that we might recognize their names when we see it, but a lot that we wouldn't. So how much of this was new to you? Oh, gosh. Well, you see, I, I had written a, a history of Bell Fountain Cemetery starting in 2002. So I a lot of it I had been researching since then, but it was new when I started then mm -hmm. at that time. And Where, some, is, some was new right now when, you know, I'd get an idea and then I would go to the library and research it. Wow, really? <laughs> St. Louis Public Library downtown? or I, I used downtown. I used the county library. It has a wonderful genealogical St. Louis section. And most of all, I used the History Museum because they really have lots of... Um, primary documents. A gentleman by the name of Esley Hamilton wrote the foreword to your book. Who is he? Uh, he's a St. Louis County Preservation Historian. So he's an employee of the county and he works hard to make sure that architectural monuments of, are not lost in this county but he just has such a broad a concept of all St. Louis history. The first thing he said, his first sentence in his foreword in your book, when it comes to history, what's important? with question mark. Was that hard for you to determine what's important? You know, it, what's important to me might not be what's important to everyone. Most of the histories that I read were mostly political and geographic <laughs> histories. And so to me, the culture, I used to be a professor of art history, so the cultural aspects are more important. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to think about what was important, what made St. Louis what it was, so I was going to put it, and, and sports too, baseball, you know, the murders, you know, things, the things that people think about all the time that mm -hmm. capture our imagination. And how many subjects are there in this book? I, I, it looks like a couple hundred? Yeah, at least 200, I would say. All right. <laughs> now you picked out um, a few that we're going to talk about today, and you, you sort of tied them together in a theme. What, were you, what was your idea there? My theme was people, or even the whole city, uh, recovering from adversity. When something happens that you think has got you really knocked down. For instance, starting in 1849 with the Great Fire, the city almost burned down. It was uh, May 17th, a steamboat caught on fire, and, and, and the rope burned. And so then it went and went all down the riverfront. So all of those boats caught on fire. Then the city, which had was wooden warehouses up on the levee, the city only went three quarters of a mile 
back from the riverfront, they thought they were going to lose the whole city. Now, obviously, this is a, a painting, an illustration, not a, a photograph. What can you tell me about that image? That is that is a Courier and Ives print, and it captured the imagination of the whole country because here was the city that was almost devastated. In fact, there was a local hero, Tom Targi, who had moved here just 11 years before. He was the captain of a volunteer fire company, and he had this great idea to create a fire break by throwing gunpowder and uh, and destroying a row of buildings so the fire wouldn't be able to leap over it. And he lost his life in the process mm. when he saved the city. Chicago had a great fire too, didn't it? And it also became a great um, opportunity because all this insurance money comes in, like $5 million of buildings were devastated, like close to $200 million today. But all this insurance money came in and they rebuilt with the most modern, you know, the irons and uh, buildings that are like the old warehouse in McLeese Landing today. And then everyone wanted to move west, and this is where they came. Well, thank goodness for modern fire protection. Something yes. like that would never happen no. today. We don't even think about that. No. And, uh, this, you know, one building it, it might go up as a tragedy, but not right. the whole city. Absolutely. Let's look at another image that you brought along from your book, St. Louis, an Illustrated Timeline. Oh, this is James Buchanan Eads. Um, he came from Indiana. His, he was, his family had been wealthy. He was named James Buchanan after the president, but his father was kind of a ne'er-do-well. And when they arrived in St. Louis, the steamboat caught fire, another fire story, and they lost all their worldly goods. And the father went up the river trying to find work. So his mother started a boarding house, and he had to drop out of school at age 14 and the man of the family to support the family. He was selling apples on the riverfront. But he then he went to work for a clerk for a dry goods company, and the owner recognized this was really a brilliant man. And that may be for one thing, when um, he gets stuck on a problem, he would play chess. A lot of people do that, but he would play with his back to the chessboard because it made it more challenging. So he let him have free range of his library, reading his library. So he educated himself. And in the 1920s, the deans of all the engineering colleges in the United States voted on the top five engineers of all time, and James Buchanan Ease was on that list. And he's the namesake for the bridge. For the bridge. When he got that job, he'd already developed the ironclad boats for the, so that helped the North win the Civil. He developed, he designed and built them. Uh -huh. But he'd never built a bridge before, but people had such confidence in his genius, they gave him that job. It's a beautiful bridge. I'm, I hope I have my history straight. Wasn't that the first bridge across the Mississippi at St. Louis? It was the first bridge across the Mississippi, and it was a, a revolutionary design. Before that, that you could not cross a large body of water. He had 47 patents that had to do with the design and the method of building it that allowed it. So it, it was an engineering marvel, a miracle. And it's still day. going strong today. It is. Yeah. You know, he wanted to last as long as the pyramids. That was his goal. Let's look at the next topic we have from your book. St. Louis, an illustrated timeline. Ah, baseball. Yeah, baseball. Baseball is a big one for me. This is Branch Rickey. He was a very competitive man. So when he came in, to, in, 19, in the 1920s, I think it was 1917, to manage the Cardinals, he was really disappointed. They had no money, so they couldn't field the big stars like the teams, the big cities, New York and Philadelphia. But undaunted, he came up with the concept of the farm system. So that meant there were minor league teams, and he, the major league team would own them and develop talent. And then it also, they could sell some of the talent too, so it developed their pool of resources. So by 1926, the Cardinals won the World Series, with, thanks to him. Then he left St. Louis and went to the Dodgers, and of course made world history by taking Jackie Robinson and making him to integrate baseball. And another St. Louis uh, baseball story too, of course the first woman to own a major league team on the St. Louis Cardinals. I don't know if that's I in your book or no, not. No, it isn't. I didn't know oh, I'll fill you in about oh, that later. Oh, good. Oh, I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love women's history. <laughs> Let's move along to the next image from the book mm -hmm. as we take a look at St. Louis history. Josephine oh, Baker, Josephine the singer. Josephine Baker. Now, she was someone I didn't, of course, knew she, I knew who she was, and I knew she was from St. Louis, but I didn't know that much about her until I started really researching her. What an amazing person she was. She was the daughter of an unwed mother. She grew up in the slums. Mill Creek? Mill Creek. Valley. Those were real slums at that time. Uh -huh. In fact, at once during her childhood, there was a rumor that a, a black man who lived there had raped a white woman, and there was a race riot, and white people 
burn the houses and murder Sort of them. behind Union Station, isn't that where Mill Creek was? I believe, I believe uh -huh. so, around there, yeah. Well, and she had this incredible talent, obviously, as a singer and dancer, and started performing as a very young teenager. In fact, she married her first husband when she, her first of five husbands when she was 13 here in St. Louis. But in wow. uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. there was a race riot in 1917 in St. Louis, East St. Louis, that was just terrible when white people right. um, uh, murdered a lot of African Americans, and she said that growing up with this terrible poverty and being exposed to these race riots made her determined to do something for civil rights and she spent she used her career as a bully pulpit yeah, but to I'm, advocate for civil rights i'm right aren't i she actually really had to leave st louis to do that oh yes definitely i mean she actually had to leave the united states she yeah, was really very paris, popular big in, in europe paris, wasn't right she? in paris where she was best known for la danse sauvage where she dressed in banana skins <laughs> <laughs> right i think i've seen that photograph yes. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> We're talking to Carol Shepley about her book, St. Louis, an Illustrated Timeline. We need to take a break, Carol, and we'll be back and uh, pick up on this conversation. Steve Potter, welcome back to City Corner. Carol Faring Shipley is our guest. Her latest book is St. Louis and Illustrated Timeline, and I have to read this bottom part just to get <laughs> it straight. Bl blues, baseball, books, crooks, civil rights, and the river. I guess you covered it all. Yeah, well, there are a lot of wonderful themes in St. Louis history, I think. <laughs> what do you love about St. Louis the most? Oh, God. Because you're like third or fourth generation, right? Oh, no. Fifth. Fifth. Yeah, definitely. They're, I mean, it's just such a rich city. You know, I, I do love that there's so much literature and music that's from St. Louis that, and, and baseball. Those are some of my favorites. Well, I love your book because it's easy to read the short, concise uh, subjects with great illustrations and pictures. It's really a, a wonderful book. And let's Thank look you. at some more of the, you, you just chose randomly, there are a couple of hundred topics in the book, and you chose about 10 here. Mm -hmm. This next gentleman, Luther Ely Smith, who is he? He's a great hero of mine, and he's really not that well known in the city, although that little park between the old courthouse and the arch is known as Luther Ely Smith Park. I, I mean, didn't know that. And then yeah, that's after him. He was born in Chicago. He went to Amherst, but then he came to Washington University for law school. He married a local girl, and he stayed, and he spent the rest of the life of his life trying to improve St. Louis. He was involved in getting playgrounds here around the turn of the century. He was involved in slum clearance. He brought Harlem Bartholomew here, a city planner. He was one of the founders of the Muni. But right. what he's really, what we really honor him for, in 1933, he was coming on a train across the Eads Bridge back to St. Louis, and he looked at the riverfront, and it was all these decaying buildings, the buildings that had built after the Great Fire, the warehouses mm -hmm. that were the latest, you know, in the 1840s. Well, they weren't so great now. And he said, this is historically sacred ground. We need to honor this. We need our city to focus on the river. So he dreamed up the idea of the Jefferson National Expansion Monument and spent the rest of his life trying to plan for it. In, in fact, th they spent two years clearing 90 acres. He fought um, 40 separate lawsuits. And There's still people them. that think that was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there are. Well, and then for 20 years, it, <laughs> it um, was vacant. It right. was just a parking lot. Then they were right at that point, <laughs> I think. But when they had a contest, to, they wanted to have a, a nationally known architect designed the, the monument. They wanted $225,000 for the award to attract that kind of person. They were $40,000 short, and he wrote a check himself. Wow. Sadly, he died in 1951, 14 years before his dream was realized. But look, we really have him to thank. And look what they're doing now with the park over the highway. It's too bad he couldn't be here today to then see it. Then they're really realizing his dream, connecting the whole city finally, to the finally. river. That was the point, you right. know, have St. Louis focus on the river right. once again. Let's go to the next image from your book. 
I, and uh, Luther Ely Smith was also involved in smoke abatement, and that was this was Raymond Tucker. This was something I got the idea to research. Raymond Tucker, what was so great about him? Because he had been the mayor for three terms, and I remember when he died, my mother was really sad. He was a great man to her. But Tucker Boulevard is right. named after him, and what he really did came before his mayoral terms. Um, he was named by Mayor Bernard Dickman to be the smoke abatement czar. St. Louis was so polluted. It was pollution from the industry, right? Right. They burned soft coal, bituminous coal that came from across the river in Illinois. It was cheap and easy to get as opposed to anthracite, which is the hard coal which burns much cleaner. But it was so dark. There was one time in the 1930s when for four days, you could, it was they called it the darkness at noon. And it, it ruined the fronts of buildings and it covered your the inside of your house with soot and people had all kinds of respiratory diseases. But Raymond Tucker was the perfect person. He was an engineer who had the know-how and the technical expertise, but he was also a real politician. He used radio, newspapers, there wasn't television in those days. Mm -hmm. But he got the campaign out and changed public perceptions. And then the alderman made laws that you could no longer burn soft coal. And interesting, he really enough, he really galvanized women because the mothers were the ones who really cared because they didn't like their houses dirty and their children <laughs> coughing. <laughs> <laughs> Cleaning is a tough job. Yeah, it is, it is. Let's move to the next, mm -hmm. the next subject we have on St. Louis and Illustrated Timeline. Oh, Frankie Freeman. Oh, yeah, Frankie Freeman. She's still alive. Right. And the adversity she faced, well, as a woman and a lawyer, my goodness, when she graduated from law school, she could find no firm, no matter how talented she was, that would hire her. So she started her own law firm. She went to law school in Virginia, but she came here to St. Louis and uh, litigated successfully all kinds of civil rights cases, including one that, that um, went to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure it went to the Supreme Court. Meh. But anyway, it was in St. Louis, and it made it so that they could no longer segregate the housing projects. Right. But in recognition of her great skill and all she'd accomplished, Lyndon Johnson named her to the first Civil Rights Commission in 1964. And I feel certain she was involved when uh, Martin Luther King came to St. Louis. Oh, she yes. was She was in the group oh, definitely. that went around town with him. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one thing you mentioned in your book, too, um, a lot about the, the black experience in St. Louis and how St. Louis has produced a lot of great black artists, musicians, that sort of thing. So many. I mean, this was this is always, and, and it still is today with Nellie. You know, it's, it continues. But, of course, we have Josephine Baker. I mean, people who are superstars. Miles, Be uh, Miles, Miles Davis, Davis. <laughs> Chuck Berry. I got them confused. Right. I mean, people who... All, the whole world acknowledges the Beatles, the Rolling Stones acknowledge these people. As All right, yeah, it's major influences. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> Let's look at the next image. Oh, the 1964 World uh, Series card, World Series winning Back to Cardinals. baseball. Back to baseball. This is a favorite of mine. Um, this, this was when I was growing up. The Yankees always won the American League pennant, and they usually won the World Series. They had, you know, Maris and Mantle and Yogi Berra and Whitey Ford. They had this huge star. But the behind-the-scenes story was their owner was really a racist. He wouldn't have any of the, you know, the player, the black players that Branch Rickey had fought to, to bring on board. Mm -hmm. Well, where the Cardinals were at that time considered the most successfully integrated team in baseball. So many of our big stars, Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Bill White, they were all African-American. And we had Julian Javier, who was Hispanic. So they, while the um, Yankees easily cinched the American League title, the Cardinals didn't win it until the last day of the series. We've had that happen a lot before, too. They were 10 games out. No, they were six and a half games out with 10 games left to play. <laughs> so, but then they won, and then they were behind in the series, then they tied it up. Ken Boyer hit a grand slam, you know, um, and um, Bill, Bob Gibson pitched the seventh game on no rest, and they won. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a baseball fan. Uh, yes, slightly. I don't know how I knew that. I think we've got two more images to look at, so why don't we take a look at those in the time we have remaining. Uh, this was a gentleman. I actually had he and his wife on this program. I've been doing this show like 15 years, believe it or not. And for, I think it was the first couple of years I did the show, I had he and his wife on. Yeah, Max Starkloff and his wife Colleen, they're an incredible couple. And they are leaders in the disability, right? Um, what happened to him? What a story. What a story. I mean, he was like this 
handsome, outgoing, kind of wild guy with lots of girlfriends. And he was driving his little Austin Healey sports car. He'd been, the alcohol was involved, so we say, <laughs> on those curving roads out across the river, across the Missouri and around Augusta. And it flipped over and he woke up a quadriplegic and they gave him the last rites. And they didn't think he'd live more than a few months in those days. They thought it was over. And his mother, who's a real hero in this story too, who just fought and fought for him. She tried to keep him at home, but it's really difficult to care for a quadriplegic. So he was sent to St. Joseph's Hill Infirmary in um, Eureka, Missouri. In fact, a good friend of mine, Charlie Claggett, has just written an inspiring book about this whole story. Um, so he was sent with to a, a nursing home for old men who were going to die in mm. his 20s. And Colleen, his wife, fell in love with him there. And she's oh, a that's nurse. that's where they met. That's where they met. She was a nurse. And he learned to paint with, uh, with his mouth, and that helped him. And in um, 1970, in his um, nursing home, that's where they started the Paraquad. And they, that's where they got the cuts on the curbs. I mean, because a little, you know, an eight-inch cut might as well be an eight-inch wall. For oh, they're responsible for that. They're responsible for that. I, I want you to say that again, Paraquad. Paraquad. That's the name of the organization they started. They started that, and now there's the Starcloth, um, there's a, the Starcloth Institute, it's called. And didn't he just pass away? He just passed away. Like, In yeah. 2014, I think, yeah. right? Yes, yes. So he was an amazing, interesting man, yeah. but, but his mission goes on. Maybe it on. was 2013, but yeah. yeah. But his mission goes on, and, and his wife, Colleen, continues. All right, let's take a look at our last image from your book, St. Louis and Illustrated Timeline. Oh, the Great Flood in 1993. So we started with the Great Fire, and we're concluding with the Great Flood. Uh, there, it had been a really rainy fall in 1992, and, and the rivers were swollen, and then it rained and rained in the spring, and they kind of knew it was going to happen. But it, um, I talked to another friend of mine, Jane Sainert, who owns the Smokehouse and the Annie Guns restaurant in Chesterfield, where the levees breached. They knew it was coming. Everybody was supposed to evacuate. But they said, oh, it won't be bad. It won't be bad. So they gave, she and her husband had permission to stay so they could get the food out of the lockers. Well, they, um, they almost lost their lives. I mean, they were rescued by boats. There were $12 billion worth of damage mm -hmm. in Missouri alone. But luckily, the fact that it breached in Chesterfield is probably what saved St. Louis, because it came within a Yeah, foot it actually or affected two. me a little. I live 10 blocks from the Mississippi, and I was without water for a couple of weeks. I mean, uh. my house wasn't <laughs> flooded or anything. Water, but. water everywhere, but not <laughs> a drop to drink. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it was yeah. like. Ah, the good time. Yeah, yeah. Um, your book is published by Reedy Press, and there's a, you mentioned a William Marion Reedy in the yes. book. Yes, William Marion Reedy is another person like Luther Ely Smith that all St. Louis know about. I mean, St. Louis was kind of the literary capital of the world in the late 19th century, turn of the century, because of William Marion Reedy. He was so important. He was born in Kerry Patch, which was the Irish district, which was a very poor area. His father was a policeman, and he was educated in the Catholic schools, and he educated himself quite a bit at the Mercantile Library. He started out working for the Globe Democrat as a reporter, and then he started, became the editor in 1990. In 1899, I believe, of the Mirror, where he was the first person to publish Edgar Lee Masters with his Spoon River anthology. He championed Theodore Dreiser when everybody said his book, Sister Carrie, was a, a, a loser. Thomas Hardy was so discouraged he'd stop writing, and, and uh, Reedy championed him. He was one of the first to publish Emily Dickinson, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was not the first to publish him, but he. Mm -hmm made them like the literary superstars there. Ezra Pound, Amy Lowell, Sarah Teasdale. Well, Carol, I love your book, and we've just really been the tip of the iceberg, what you're gonna find in it. You've got another one in the works coming out later in the year? Yes, I'm working on a book called Luminous Sights, and this is just about one person. It's a New York artist named Kathy Bice, who was born in Michigan, and where she grew up right near Lake Michigan and absorbed these beautiful landscapes. And so she does abstract landscapes, like she's most uh, compared to Turner, William Turner, that the movie Mr. Turner is mm -hmm. about now. Where does your inspiration come from when, you, when you're gonna decide on a topic to write about? Hmm. That's a hard question. <laughs> you know, I, li I like to get up really early, and a lot of times I'll just like I'll just kind of lie in bed, and and that's the, my best time. I'm not thinking about all the problems of the day, 
ideas just come to me. And a lot of times, when I am working on something, I'll think of a new way to rewrite it, and I'll be all excited. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you, do you, are you real disciplined? Do you like you know sit down at your desk between two and four every day, or is it just when the mood strikes you? Oh no, it's no. You have to be disciplined. I mean. It, you know, the talent is one thing, and you can't do it without talent, but you've got to be disciplined. I, I mean, I'm at it, you know, eight, ten hours a day. Carol Shepley in St. Louis, an illustrated timeline. We'll have information on where to get the book, and I highly recommend it. And Carol, thanks so much for joining oh, us Oh, Steve, today. it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. You bet. I'm Steve Potter. That's all the time we have for this edition of City Corner. Thanks for watching. Join us next time. Bye.